So it's 10 o'clock by my time, so I think we can get started. Welcome everybody to the Carl Open Education webinar series. Uh, today we have uh, Rajiv Janjiani, who is the Associate Vice, Pro Vice Provost of Open Education from Kwantlen Polytechnic University, and he will be speaking about supporting open educational practices from the library. For those of you who are interested, we are recording this, uh, so it will be made available and we will send out a link once it is up on uh, the CARL website. Uh, again, if you do have any questions, feel free to type them into the group chat and we will make sure to uh, notify Rajiv of those questions. So we can just get started then. Terrific. Oh, well, thank you, Erin. I hope uh, everyone can hear me okay as I've just unmuted myself. Uh, even a, a quick yes from someone in the chat would work. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning to those of you um, on the West Coast and, and good afternoon to those of you uh, further East. Um, it's really a, a joy to, to spend some time with all of you, even at a distance. Um, I, I have the many privileges in this work um, I think but one of the one of the biggest ones um, moving from a fact being a faculty member to an administrator and working in open education more broadly I think has been uh, getting to work with librarians day in day out um, and certainly you know when I was uh, just teaching psychology six seven years ago uh, I confess I wouldn't have been able to tell you the difference between a systems and a liaison librarian for example uh, but of course uh, this has been one of great joys uh, but given the the expertise in the room I mean I'm seeing of course Caroline and Karen from KPU Erin of course I'm seeing Deborah here Inba lots of people from across the country with tremendous expertise and experience in this space so um, uh, perhaps I can just preface this by by yeah. suggesting whoops yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it sounds like uh, someone's not muted. Um, but I'll preface this by saying that, uh, you know, I th I'll share some of my uh, thoughts and ideas, but by no means is this uh, an exhausted, comprehensive account. Uh, and I'd encourage anyone who has uh, experience, especially across different types of institutions, to share your ideas in the chat or in the discussion at the end. Uh, but thanks for allowing me to, 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 to be in your space today. Um, I'll begin uh, just by noting, actually, in passing, uh, the image that looks in the background of this title slide is from Cleveland, uh, where um, the ACRL meeting was um, earlier this year, and there's this huge sort of rubber stamp that says the word free, uh, not too far from where the conference was, which was sort of an interesting place to start talking about this work. But of course, as you all know, uh, with Open, we're not just talking about free, and we'll get into that. Um, Sorry, I'm still hearing beeps and, and noises in the background. So perhaps just a reminder that um, uh, if you can, uh, to try and mute uh, your mics uh, to make it easier for people to, to listen in. Um, but here's a snapshot of uh, Kwantlen, where I have had the privilege of working for the last uh, 12 years. Uh, Kwantlen, in case you don't know, is a public post-secondary institution in British Columbia. Uh, we serve uh, over 20,000 students across five urban campuses. And what you're looking at is, in fact, uh, our uh, Surrey campus's uh, library, which is uh, where, uh, where my office is, quite happily, in fact. Um, but I do want to acknowledge uh, that uh, Kwantlen, of course, uh, across its campuses, uh, is situated on the traditional unceded uh, uh, ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Semiamu, Suwasan, Kikate, and Kwikwetlem peoples. Uh, and of course, it's a privilege to work and, uh, on this space. Um, I'm going to try and skip fairly quickly over to beyond the question of the why of open because I'm assuming since all of you uh, have signed up for this webinar uh, to get into supporting open educational practices from the library that you don't really need to, to uh, an explanation or an argument uh, for the why um, but certainly you will know things like uh, the, the conversation about open resources on, on campuses across the country has often focused on the issue of affordability. Um, but just to come back to this, I mean, I think the, I'm sure you're all aware that um, the cost of commercial textbooks, for example, rose by over a thousand percent between 1977 and, and 2017, uh, very consistently between three and four times the rate of inflation. To this. Um, textbook broke Alberta, where you have students saying that they could have spent um, the $650 they spent in a semester on textbooks on rent. Or indeed, um, textbook broke SK for Saskatchewan, 
uh, where they, this particular student I'm trying to show you spent $750 and they'd rather spend their money on food. Now, there are, uh, uh, I think, are many suggestions that I would have for um, libraries that are looking to uh, support this work uh, around not just OER, but open ed practices in the space. And one of them certainly has to do with the value of local data. Uh, one study that we did uh, here at KPU, and in fact across 22 BC institutions, looked at how many of our students were not purchasing some of the required textbooks because of cost, not registering for certain courses or taking fewer courses or even withdrawing from courses on the basis of cost. Um, and that study has had some alarming statistics. It's not quite as severe as it is in the US, of course, but we found that 54% were not purchasing at least one of the required course textbooks because of cost. 30% uh, report that they earn a poorer grade, 27% taking fewer courses, 26 not registering for a specific course, and 17% dropping or withdrawing from a course because of textbook costs, which of course is quite alarming. Um, I think on the one hand, where we see st student behaviors uh, sort of indicating that textbook affordability is a serious issue, uh, one of the things that's been slower uh, to follow that is faculty attitudes. Uh, but I was very pleased to see that last year, uh, Inside Higher Education ran their annual survey of faculty attitudes on technology. Um, and according to that particular uh, survey last year, now 83% of faculty of that nationally representative sample in the US agreed that textbooks and course materials cost too much. And I think a lot of the credit for raising awareness of the problem of textbook affordability, of course, uh, goes to the leaders in this space who more often than not indeed work in the library. Uh, another interesting uh, uh, survey, which uh, was from the Babson Research Group, which asked similar questions, uh, but provided some triangulation uh, in, in, this, in this area, uh, found that in, if you look at all faculty as a whole, um, you can collapse those who strongly agree or, 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 or at least uh, somewhat agree. Uh, and you find that uh, overall, about 80% of all faculty, again, agree that the cost of course materials is a serious problem for their students. Interestingly, that percentage is quite a bit higher. It's closer to about 87% if faculty are teaching introductory courses. Uh, and that's certainly one of the areas where OER has, has focused and had quite a bit of success. So when we're talking about open educational resources, uh, of course, hopefully we are all uh, aware that we're not just talking about resources that are um, free. Uh, we're certainly talking about free being one of the affordances of open. Uh, but in terms of the five R permissions, we're talking about resources that can be freely reused by students, that can be adapted, revised, remixed, localized, contextualized by faculty, uh, retained, <clears throat> unlike leased digital textbooks, and redistributed as well. Um, and so I'm just going to pause briefly uh, to check to see, Erin, have you had a, any success with the slides? Uh, yes, we actually have Lise who is going through uh, the slides, trying, doing a good job of matching up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bless you. Thank you very much, Lise. Uh, I'll try and give you uh, an indicator. But if you can switch to the slide with the Georgia study at this point, um, there's quite a bit of research um, on the impact and uh, on educational outcomes of the adoption of OER. And again, some of this research is local. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for example, Christina Hendricks and her colleagues at UBC uh, ran a study uh, looking at adoptions in physics. Uh, we ran a study over here at KPU looking at adoptions in introductory psychology. But this study is one I like to point to because it, it mirrors uh, all of the others, which generally shows that the adoption of OER relative to the adoption of commercial resources uh, uh, results in, in, in a slight improvement in performance overall but a disproportionately uh, higher uh, uh, improvement for students already marginalized in various ways. So in the US, Pell recipient students are those who are socioeconomically marginalized. Uh, so whether it's those students, part-time students, or populations historically underserved by higher ed, you're finding that generally drop failure withdrawal rates from courses tend to decrease and the average GPA uh, increases. So far from the question of whether OER uh, hurt students, uh, you could really flip the question around uh, and really start to inquire whether the cost of a commercial resource uh, justifies uh, the difference uh, in their performance. Uh, moving on uh, to another survey, um, 
Uh, and just this one was interesting because now it really pivots to OER. And, and when we look at in the Inside Higher Ed survey again that I referred to, showing that 70% of faculty at this point strongly agree, or at least agree, that colleges should embrace OER, this is amazing to me. Uh, this is far from where things were five, six, seven years ago. So certainly, again, I think the awareness issue is being addressed in many ways, uh, and that's one of the main challenges. But just to echo the point I was making earlier, the value of one local study, heavens, I would say it's worth at least 10 other studies. Uh, so certainly collecting data on student textbook affordability locally and working with uh, faculty and perhaps teaching and learning centers uh, to conduct research to look at the impact of these initial early adoptions uh, on outcomes, uh, I, I think is incredibly powerful uh, as a tool. Um, next slide, please. So at KPU, uh, of course, we do quite a bit of work uh, with OER uh, and open education more broadly. Uh, and if you're interested, of course, uh, in, in digging into some of the things I'm going to refer to more, uh, I invite you to visit our website, uh, which is just kpu.ca slash open. Uh, next slide. But of course, a lot of our work clusters around open educational resources. Um, and if you visit that website, you will see an infographic that is, uh, is interactive that gives you a sense of some of the supports available. But I think one of the major things is always going to be how do you enhance the discoverability of OER on your campus. Uh, and I think uh, many strategies have been de deployed with great success locally, but elsewhere. So you think about um, uh, mark records that have been released by various groups, BC Campus, of course, the Open Textbook Library in the United States that have been issued with a public domain stamp. So importing those mark records into your collections, uh, lots of places, you know, despite how many of us might feel about LibGuides, have openly licensed their LibGuides for OER. Um, perhaps embedding, uh, there's a wonderful sort of meta search engine for OER that was developed by the State University of New York system called OASIS, uh, and they uh, have provided the embed code. Uh, so many institutions have embedded uh, that search engine within their library pages for OER as well. Uh, and of course, working uh, more directly uh, when it comes to liaison librarians uh, and the departments that they, in, and that they work with or the programs they work with uh, to share new um, high and high quality OER that, that, are, that are published. Uh, but the second practice I think is especially powerful as well. So BC Campus, for example, and in the past eCampus Ontario as well and others have run a review program. Uh, one of the rationales for this is this is, I think, one of these relatively low cost in terms of the investment, but high impact practices. The Open Textbook Network in the United States um, has more than a thousand member campuses, um, and I used to work with them uh, running their workshops. And I can tell you that uh, that around about 60% of faculty who attend, uh, well, let me back up. Faculty who attend these workshops are invited within a few days to write a review. Uh, of an open textbook in their discipline. And roughly 60% of the faculty who write a review of an open textbook end up adopting it. So this is one of those small incentives, those small nudges in the direction of, you know, um, actually look at the resource and you might actually be quite happily surprised. So I find a review program is incredibly powerful in addition to supporting discoverability. Um, Douglas College, of course, uh, Deborah's on the line from Douglas. They uh, are one of the institutions that pioneered the idea of an adoption grant. Uh, and we followed their lead over here at KPU. We're working with the Student Association. We're jointly funding a small grant where faculty receive, I think it's $500 for any professional development activity of their choice, simply in exchange for adopting OER. So this is not a question of having to create or adapt things. This is just acknowledging perhaps the effort involved in, in adjusting their lecture slides or anything else. And of course, I think if you just focus on the top line, that's enough to, to, to really move the dial, especially on the early adopters to the point where uh, you're able to then leverage those early successes, especially if they're in high enrollment areas, uh, to, to really get more of a movement going. Uh, but of course, at KPU, we do a lot more than adopting. Um, we do quite a bit of adaptation and creation as well. And one of the reasons that's possible is, on the one hand, there are OER grants that are available to our, our faculty and staff. Uh, so if they're interested in, um, uh, of course, adapting, localizing, customizing in any way, remixing OER, um, including with their students in the form of open pedagogy. Uh, but even if they want to create things from scratch, um, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, 
in addition to the grants, the library, in fact, has uh, has uh, been piloted initially and then rolled out more fully uh, what we call OPIS, uh, Open Publishing Suite. And in fact, two of the uh, people on the call today, uh, Caroline Daniels and Karen Meyer Klein, uh, co coordinate uh, the Open Publishing Suite. So it's a wonderful uh, partnership um, with Open Education and the Library. So as you can see, whether folks want to create and adapt using Pressbooks, uh, the commonly used open source platform for working with open textbooks, or indeed if they want to work with the open journal systems, um, that's a increasingly uh, popular form of open pedagogy that we're seeing, uh, or certainly search and discover, use the institutional repository, which is Quora, uh, or get their courses ready um, by uh, identifying materials that would enable their courses to be zero textbook cost. Uh, the OPIS uh, program is, is a massive uh, boon for our campus. Um, next slide, please, Lise. And so, of course, I'm talking about open educational resources predominantly because that's what our ZTC program is centered on. And when I say ZTC, you can see I'm talking about zero textbook cost programs. Um, so just for, for background, um, KPU is the leading institutional adopter of, of open textbooks and other open educational resources in, in Canada. And we recently launched our seventh uh, ZTC program. Uh, the latest one is the Bachelor of Arts degree in general studies. So of course, at this point, students are able to uh, certainly complete their, their bachelor's degree in general studies at KPU, um, saving just over $5,000 if we're going by average textbook costs. Um, but indeed, it's not just a question of 40 specific courses. In fact, there are at this point more than 700 uh, individual uh, or unique courses that faculty offer that are zero textbook cost at KPU. And that, of course, is a combination of just not just open educational resources, but also strategically uh, subscribing to databases, ebooks uh, that permit you know, enough concurrent users to allow individual sections of courses to flip to zero textbook cost. So next slide, please, Lise. And I think um, if you see the animations, you can just click straight through so you see all three graphs. But this is just, a, again, a quick idea of how this work has grown. Uh, we've been running our ZTC programs for two years now, uh, and you can see there's been quite a bit of growth. Um, so certainly, if you look at the uh, bar chart on the right, um, when you have more than 300 faculty, of course, actively participating, uh, I think we're certainly, I think, past the point of culture change, where it's becoming more and more normal within the institution. Uh, and even though I don't expect that we're actually going to get to every faculty member, that's not a, a reasonable goal, uh, certainly it's been normalized to the point where um, keeping up with the demand, the inquiries uh, for, you know, whether it's applications for OER grants, um, uh, interest in workshops and training, um, certainly it's getting hard to keep up with that demand, which uh, I think is a nice problem to have. Next slide, please. So I would say that one of the things that, that you may notice at KPU is that uh, in addition to specific programs uh, like the ground program, the publishing program, the review program, and so on, um, open educational practices has been baked into our strategic planning. Um, so if you look at our academic plan, for example, it has about nine goals. And goal six, as you can see, uh, focuses specifically on, on open education, uh, both in terms of the research and the practices. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we have a strategic plan that deals specifically with open education. So it actually takes the, the broader goals of the academic plan and then fleshes them out a, uh, through a series of specific strategies. Uh, so I invite you to, to browse through our strat plan for open ed. Uh, and of course, because the, the medium is at least, you know, part of the message, uh, you'll see that the strategic plan for open education itself has been developed within Pressbooks. Um, it embeds all kinds of um, features with H5P, the open source technology. Um, and of course, it's been openly licensed as well. So we invite you to, to, to reuse and adapt anything you like. But beyond the, the sort of high level strategic planning, uh, you will also notice some recent developments at KPU. So in the next slide, you'll notice that uh, over the last uh, year or so, we've uh, adopted a new intellectual property procedure and policy. Uh, and I'm just showing you one quick paragraph from that, uh, where you can see that university members are encouraged to create and adapt OER. Of course, do other things as well, publish in open access outlets, adopt open science practices, um, which, of course, is, is a paragraph that makes me very, very happy. 
not just because it encourages it, but because it doesn't mandate it. So I think a couple of notes over here. We've, um, at KPU, I think in many ways, we decided not to, for many reasons, we decided not to lead with policy. And I think you can see the respect for academic freedom in, in this policy as well, in that it is uh, supporting the practice, it encourages it, but it doesn't mandate it. And that, uh, on the one hand, you know, I think policy at a point where it was effectively codifying what was existing practice for many faculty, uh, but also baked into these policies is that respect for academic freedom, which is something that I would certainly encourage in, in general. On the next slide, you'll see a more sort of micro level policy uh, or more of a procedure really, uh, which is that about a, a year and a half ago, our Senate Standing Committee on Curriculum um, uh, approved the inclusion of a couple of check boxes uh, in the procedure for developing new courses or when courses come up for review every five years. And as you can see, um, courses that are being developed or reviewed now have to undergo a search for relevant OER, uh, which again is one of these fabulous nudges for awareness, but once again being very explicit that nobody's required to adopt anything. We just want people to look. And of course they can decide for themselves, look, I, I saw there was nothing available, or I looked and it wasn't good enough, that's great. Uh, but just nudging people to have to look of course, this means that within five years, in theory, every single course at KPU will undergo a search for relevant OER, which I imagine will do. Not an institution that, that has to deal with tenure and promotion. Uh, of course, uh, we have probationary periods, and, but beyond that, we have a fairly flat structure. Uh, but of course, uh, I do want to highlight uh, that if you're looking at a different kind of policy, uh, I think UBC is obviously the exemplar over here when it comes to how powerful student advocacy was in, in moving the dial on the inclusion of language that supports the creation of OER um, in their tenure and promotion procedures, uh, particularly I think under educational leadership uh, for, the, uh, for the teaching stream of the faculty. Okay, so moving on from there, I, I, I'm still sort of talking about OER in many ways. And at this point, I think in terms of general uh, ideas and strategies, uh, I think we've been talking about enhancing the discoverability of OER in various ways, uh, review programs, grant programs, uh, and so on. But I think one of the things we've learned um, even with uh, building infrastructure and campus supports for, for open, is being very aware and, and taking advantage of the different uh, gateways to this work. And so I think for many faculty, it's true that the cost savings for students, and in particular, the social justice implications of those cost savings that tend to accrue disproportionately in favor of marginalized students, that's enough. But for other faculty, of course, um, it's never going to be about the cost savings. Uh, that might be a bonus, a nice bonus, but it's not going to be the factor that actually drives their decision making. Um, and not to say that this is the same group necessarily, but we're aware and, and we certainly experienced that a different um, entry or different uh, pathway to, to open practices has to do with the pedagogy. So it's not just about uh, equitable access to knowledge. Uh, open education, of course, is also about equitable access to knowledge creation. And so on the next slide, um, you'll see that I'm talking about open pedagogy over here. Open pedagogy, incidentally, was identified as one of 10 uh, major areas to, to focus on in the Cape Town Plus 10 Declaration. Uh, and this is where we go beyond simply uh, you know, paying lip service to the 5R permissions of OER and actually looking to see what you can do with teaching and learning if you allow openness and open licensing to infuse your pedagogy. Um, so, of course, um, open pedagogy has many understandings and definitions and it's one of the sort of a fun space to work in. Uh, but one way to understand it is that it's an access oriented commitment to learner driven education. But it's also a process of using tools and, and, and building architectures for learning that allow students to shape the public knowledge commons uh, of which they are a part. So open pedagogy in practice, for example, uh, might look like many things. It, but, but in addition to enhancing the idea of access for students, it also deliberately tries to amplify student agency. So if you look at the next slide, 
uh, which um, is a funny old illustration from uh, a book that was published uh, just over 100 years ago. This is a book uh, that depicted various uh, scenarios from the future. And this image, which always makes me chuckle, depicts in, in, at the time the classroom of the future. Well, it was really, I, I suppose, the classroom in the year 2000. And I love showing this image because I think it's often easier to understand what open pedagogy is by contrasting it with something else, by understanding it in, in relief. And in this, in this particular illustration, I think you can see the ideology that's baked into, uh, into the pedagogy in terms of who is permitted to be the instructor, who is permitted to be the student, you know, how, how the learning has been designed, uh, magic transmission or electric transmission of information into the students' minds, no active learning, no, no pure interaction, um, no need to take notes. And of course, certainly from, uh, from a research university's point of view, uh, hopefully you can notice that the graduate student is the one doing the actual la uh, manual labor over here. But if you go to the next slide, I, I think for me that illustration illustrates in many ways what the, the Brazilian uh, philosopher, educator, Paulo Freire described as the banking concept of education. Um, he wrote in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, that this model of education turns them, students, into containers to be filled by the teacher. The more completely she fills the receptacles, the better a teacher she is. The more meekly the receptacles permit themselves to be filled, the better students they are. And so education thus becomes the act of depositing in which the students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor. And finally, in the banking concept of education, knowledge is a gift that's bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. And that last paragraph ha has a lot going on. But if you think about open pedagogy as a real reaction to the banking concept, in the next slide, uh, in practice, this could mean many things. This could mean co-creating course policies with your students, um, schedules of work, rubrics, uh, uh, and of course, the idea of assignments as well. So on the next slide, uh, of course, many of you are familiar with uh, Wiki, Wiki, Wikipedia assignments. Many institutions, many libraries uh, lead workshops for faculty to learn how to edit uh, Wikipedia. But I love what Amin Azam is doing at the University of California. And of course, he works with his medical students to edit, to improve, to augment um, Wikipedia articles for a variety of medical topics. Uh, this is as part of their coursework. And of course, um, for, for students who may end up being GPs, they work in, an, uh, you know, in a clinic, somebody comes in and they have to explain complex medical concepts in a couple of minutes in lay language. Editing Wikipedia, of course, is a brilliant way to hone that skill while at the same time simultaneously generating, uh, to, you know, uh, tremendously contributing to the widely used public resource. So editing Wikipedia would certainly be a form of open pedagogy. On the next slide, uh, you'll see an example of two students at Simon Fraser University here in BC, who as part of a course, uh, created a brief instructional video for a uh, theory of persuasion by Robert Cialdini. Um, and they won an international student video competition but more important than the, than the money and the recognition is the fact that their video is now being used across the world to teach the science of persuasion, which is incredibly powerful. So yes, all of these projects are producing OER, but that's not the primary uh, purpose in some sense. The primary purpose has to do a lot more uh, with authentic learning uh, that really gives students a sense of contributing to the wider world. It's not busy work. There's a whole slew of open pedagogical practices that, that surround open textbooks themselves. On the next slide, you'll see one of the most low barrier ways to do this is to work with, your, with, with students to annotate existing open textbooks. Of course, in this case, we're using the open source annotation tool called Hypothesis uh, to, <clears throat> on the top, a student, Lana, uh, this is my class, by the way, so uh, I know who these students are, uh, but Lana is annotating uh, a paragraph in the text to provide an example from her own life, to, to augment, to provide an additional example uh, that complements the example that's already in the text. And of course, that makes the resource richer for, for students in her class and of course, future cohorts of students. Um, and at the bottom, you're seeing another use of it where Alexa is, uh, again, annotating, but in this case, um, uh, linking to a video clip uh, from a, you know, a, a television show. Um, and so when it comes to 
um, you know, thinking about what cultural references make sense to students, of course, students are in the best position to do that. Um, and of course, faculty hopefully are no longer relying on their ancient Seinfeld references, but I would leave it to students. But if you think about this over time, students are again contributing. Um, they can see the purpose of this work uh, and they can enrich the teaching and learning resource themselves. On the next slide, you're seeing an example of uh, not annotation, but curation of OER by students. In this case, Robin DeRosa, who teaches at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire, worked with her former students to choose which public domain readings would be included in the first edition of the Open Anthology of Early American Literature. Uh, this, of course, is, uh, is readings that were all in, already in the public domain. Uh, and so working in press books, the students were able to uh, uh, curate the OER, which, of course, they ended up annotating as well. So in addition to annotating and curating OER, of course, students are perfectly equipped to do, to do more. Um, there's instructors, for example, who are teaching economics, where the theory of macroeconomics is not necessarily changing one semester to the next, but perhaps the unemployment statistics are. And so imagine a, re, a course assignment where students are digging into Statistics Canada, um, obtaining the latest statistics month by month, recreating the charts and updating the textbook in terms of the graphs every semester. It's a terrific skills for the students, research skills, statistical skills, graphical skills, and of course, in, in, contributing in a way that makes uh, OER more current, more responsive than any commercial resource could ever hope to be. On the next slide, you'll see an example from the Ohio State University, where it's not just adapting OER, but in fact creating from scratch, where students taking a third year course on environmental science have been writing these bite-sized chunks. Um, the volume is edited and overseen by the faculty in the program. And of course, environmental science bites is now used by many other institutions as well. So, uh, and you'll see other institutions doing this kind of thing as well. The next slide shows you students at the University of Buffalo in a publishing course who are doing the same thing. And that word empowerment will keep standing out uh, because of course that's what it's about. It's about authentic uh, learning that gives students a lot more agency, uh, which of course is a key piece when it comes to uh, their empowerment. So just to recap, uh, beyond the Wikipedia and, and video assignments, when it comes to OER directly or open textbooks, uh, I see at least five options where students can annotate OER, they can curate OER, they can adapt, which includes updating OER, they can create from scratch, and in many cases, of course, they can also develop ancillary resources, whether it's activities or question banks or other things like that. And I'm, I'm suggesting all of this because I think working with other stakeholders like teaching and learning centers, offering, for example, um, uh, workshops on various open pedagogical practices is a very powerful way uh, to grow the community beyond uh, beyond the community that would that would just be focused on questions of access and social justice. And of course, there's also the added benefit of faculty recognize who the innovative teachers are in their programs, who they turn to for ideas and advice. And the more you have these kinds of faculty getting involved in, in leading with open education, even creating OER with their students, uh, the more I think you can widen uh, the pool, the population that you're targeting on campus. At KPU, we do a lot of work in open pedagogy, uh, certainly in partnership with the Teaching and Learning Commons, with regular workshops, uh, but of course with other institutions as well. Uh, one of the institutions we work with, on the next slide you'll see, is Montgomery College, uh, which is in Maryland. Uh, two years ago, they pioneered a open pedagogy fellowship that focused on faculty working with their students to develop OER that um, served progress towards specific sustainable development goals. Um, it was a wonderful idea, of course, and so we reached out and asked if we could partner with them. And we just finished, you'll see on our website, the first cohort where we had faculty across both institutions that have been paired. So this is an inter-institutional, international, but also interdisciplinary uh, fellowship, where we had faculty, for example, in one case, from um, sustainable agriculture and anthropology. Uh, in another case, from um, educational studies, marketing, um, uh, and math. So if you imagine the kinds of uh, collaborations that are springing up, 
this has been really, really interesting to our faculty. Uh, and it's certainly an area uh, uh, that I expect will continue to grow as we open it up a bit further next year. But I invite you to think about ways in which uh, you can support the growing interest in open pedagogy uh, as well beyond OER. Um, ne the next slide just, just gives you a, a quick resource in case you're interested in learning more about open pedagogy in general. Um, I invite you to visit the Open Pedagogy Notebook, uh, which is just openpedagogy.org. Uh, so Robin DeRosa, who I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, is my partner in various wonderful um, social justice uh, initiatives. Um, she and I co-created this to serve two purposes. One is to give uh, people who are excited uh, at the idea of open pedagogy, but are sort of struggling with having a sense of what does this look like in practice, giving them a space where they could browse through examples. Uh, but the other is that it's a space for community to just contribute. So uh, if you already have examples of open pedagogical practices in your institutions, I invite you to, to submit them. Even if it's a brief submission, it could be the stub of an idea instead of a fully classroom tested practice. Uh, we invite you to, to submit that because it makes it a lot more helpful uh, for people to see a broad range. And then of course, for the community to be able to pick up on each other's ideas and test them and refine them further. The next slide showcases um, I suppose what the bottom half is of the infographic that I showed you the top half earlier. The first half showed you our support for OER, but of course over here you can see um, lots of information available, opportunities for workshops and training. There's the UN SDG Open Pedagogy Fellowship with Montgomery College I mentioned. And of course the third prong of the work which is now growing is the open education research. Um, a quick uh, uh, plug, which is that on um, May 14th, uh, KPU is going to be hosting <clears throat> our first, but what will be an annual research institute. So a one day training opportunity that's available, not just to KPU uh, faculty and staff, but, but folks further afield as well, um, to really get a sense of how you, how you do this kind of work. So training in terms of research and theoretical frameworks for open education research, um, practical logistical things, like how do you work with uh, research ethics board applications when you're interested in dealing with open data, uh, and of course fellowships for this kind of work as well. At the bottom, of course, you see a number of other uh, uh, ways in which the community can connect with us. And again, some of this comes directly from library technology. Um, there's an open education listserv at the institution that's uh, hosted by BC Campus very kindly that does that uh, for many institutions in our province. But at the bottom, in the middle, you'll see that we're using a, a, a queue service, a queue platform that the library uses anyway. Um, so that whether it's Caroline or Karen or myself, when somebody on campus has a question, it could be two o'clock in the morning, they're troubleshooting something with press books, they want to request training with OGS, uh, they can just pose that question um, on, the, on the queue and whoever essentially gets to it first will respond. Uh, and so again, that's been another wonderful way in which our work has been enhanced. I want to try and, and um, uh, close with a whole slew of additional resources. So beyond um, the work with, that we are doing, um, uh, which is of course not just uh, uh, supported directly out of the library and, and my office, uh, but is broadly coordinated and assisted by a, a cross-functional open education working group. Um, the next slide shows you uh, OER, a field guide for academic librarians. Uh, this is a wonderful resource that was published earlier this year. Uh, the book itself has been published with an open license. That's one of the resources I would encourage you to, to avail of. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see uh, there's a couple of chapters from a book that I uh, co-edited a couple of years ago uh, by, again, leaders uh, in uh, open education work who work out of the library. Uh, many of you will know Quill West, uh, who is at Pierce College in the US, and Anita Walls from Virginia Tech, both wonderful, experienced uh, uh, advocates for OER in the library. Uh, and again, that's another book that's openly licensed that I encourage you to, to, to download. Um, the next slide uh, gives you um, uh, sort of a heads up of, for a resource that will soon be published. Um, so at KPU, one of the things we've done is integrate uh, the marking of courses that have zero textbook cost into our course timetables uh, in partnership with our registrar's office. Um, and if you're interested in figuring out how you might do this, there is a book that's coming that lays out many different case studies, how you might do this, including with different kinds of student information systems. We use Banner, but of course others use other ones. 
And so this Spark affiliated project is on the way, uh, co-coordinated uh, by uh, or uh, co-led by, by Michelle Reed, who's at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, the next slide also gives you a sense of what else is, is coming down the pipe. Uh, there's been an IMLS supported project uh, across a few institutions that is developing OER uh, that will eventually uh, be available as a resource to be integrated for of, into LIS cur curricula. Uh, so, if, I mean, the idea eventually is uh, you know, within the training itself, uh, one would learn how to, uh, in the course of the degree, how to support this work at institutions. So that's an exciting development that I think will help uh, move the dial further. Uh, a few other resources, initiatives that you might want to be aware of. The SPARC Open Education Leadership Program uh, is, of course, is, a, is another wonderful resource. Uh, they have cohorts every year. You might want to uh, look into that. Uh, the next slide uh, shows you an example of one of SPARC's resources. So if you're interested in kickstarting a conversation campus-wide and, and thinking strategically about how you might uh, have those conversations, SPARC's Open Education Action Plan, I think, is quite a phenomenal uh, place to start. Um, the next slide points to the Creative Commons Certificate Program, which of course uh, came online um, just under a year ago, uh, where if you really want to dig deep into CC licensing uh, and sort of these edge cases to be able to speak authoritatively to, to, to the implications of this work, um, that's not a bad resource, even though it's a fairly expensive option. Um, and then of course the uh, Open Textbook Network, which is not exclusively based in the US anymore because they've expanded to um, the UK and Australia and so on. They have a certificate in OER librarianship uh, that I think is also worth uh, uh, looking at, even if only as a model. And of course for us, uh, Carl, I think, is doing incredible work. Uh, and the appointment of, of Aaron as the, as the program officer and then the broader uh, uh, committee as well uh, to steer this work, I think, is, is I'm very excited about where this is going and grateful for that leadership. So I'll close, um, even though I said I would close with the resources, I'll close with just a few brief points, uh, which is, it's not exactly cautionary, uh, but it's a reminder that, you know, with the best of intentions, with the desire to support this work, we are capable of perpetrating some harm. So the first reminder is that increasing access is of course not the same as lowering cost. Um, many ways in which that is true. The next slide reminds you that, for example, when you're developing OER or have OER grants, requiring that, for example, the guidelines of the Accessibility Toolkit published by BC Campus be followed is a really good way to ensure that we're not ignoring accessibility. Um, I'm not going to read the, the, the quotes that are coming up, but the next slide points to the importance of thinking about the issue of digital redlining and not assuming uh, that all students have access to technology or broadband internet access, uh, or indeed um, uh, that the digital is always the solution. So thinking through what your backup options are, uh, is it a print on demand facility on campus? Uh, what else are you doing uh, to make sure students have access to the OER that you're putting out? The next slide, again, I'm not going to read this, is a reminder to think critically about data privacy, uh, not the least of which has to do with the platforms that we use for this work, not just in terms of privacy legislation, but thinking about information and digital literacies um, and how students who are often the most vulnerable are often the ones who have the least experience with digital literacy skills. And so again, it's not good enough to just run with what is easy. Um, there's the ethics of students assuming that, that the institution, that faculty, that librarians have done the due diligence about, uh, for example, the implications of their digital footprint. Uh, and finally, uh, one of my favorite uh, articles and resources, uh, a, a paper published last year, which provides, I think, an incredibly powerful social justice framework for understanding OER. And even though this is based in the Global South and case studies over there, it applies to us in general. So I think it's a wonderful paper to read, uh, to think through the implications of um, uh, what does social justice look like through not just an economic lens, but also a cultural and a political lens. And the difference between what might be an ameliorative strategy uh, for let's say um, effecting cost savings for students uh, through open educational resources and what might be a truly transformative strategy 
that that actually interrogates and and challenges the existing power structures uh, through OER. Um, Libraries are often, you know, referred to as, you know, if, if you look at the Harry Potter series, rooms of requirement. And I, and I love that because, of course, it can mean many things to many people. A refuge, a place to study when you don't have secure housing and so on. Um, but, of course, sometimes all you need uh, to, to effect the kind of change is, is simply a stapler. And I think that's one of my favorite things is to watch students constantly going up to the reference desk at the KPU library. Um, and of course, you're seeing a, a wonderful red staple over over there. So uh, I'll close just by saying that, you know, whether it's um, through a stapler or, or whether it's with a, a lead pipe, I, I think uh, libraries are, are natural leaders in the space. There's incredibly powerful relationships uh, that librarians have with faculty that are a lot more consultative and less transactional, uh, and that I think positions libraries to really lead in this space. So I'll finish with that and uh, apologies for the technical difficulties, but I'm hoping we can still have a bit, a bit of a chat um, as well. Um, Erin, just a quick reminder that I don't have access to the platform anymore. So if there are questions in the chat, I'll need you to just read them out to me. Not a problem. So thank you, Rajiv. Um, you put it on a very nice kind of inspirational thought <laughs> for librarians. Um, I think I've been paying attention to the chat, I believe, the questions that were there have been answered by um, Karen. Karen. Uh, but if anybody else has any questions, we're really happy to to address them now. Here, I do want to mention that the um, Carl Open Education Working Group uh, has formed a Open Education Leadership Essentials event that is happening on January 27th and the 28th. Um, I just wanted to mention that that's kind of uh, meant to be a place to engage participants with presentations and community building and hands-on activities that relate to the building blocks of implementing open education programs on campus, on your campuses. Um, so I'm just, I will post it in the, the information. I do know that we have our registrants, but there may be a few spots left. Please, I hope you don't, uh, I hope that's okay that I'm mentioning that. Um, so there is a possibility that there are a few spaces open. Uh, so a question has come in. Um, is there, from Tina, is there a way to look at the open textbooks used in your uh, ZTCs? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, like, so I have to confess one thing over here, and, and anyone running a, a ZTC program will know this, is the biggest pain in the rear end is data management. Uh, and especially in a context where, um, you know, we're not mandating adoptions. And so even though there are some departments that have agreed department-wide to adopt, let's say, an open textbook uh, across the board, in most cases, we're talking about the choices of individual faculty. This, of course, means that every semester uh, we need to reconfirm uh, which particular combinations of instructors and courses are, are participating in the ZTC and then digging further, uh, you know, what specific resource that they're utilizing that, that actually qualifies that as ZTC. So I will say that um, that information is not uh, I mean, one of the reasons that's not public is it's just very difficult to, to keep on top of, even though we try to. Um, but that is something that we, uh, I, I have as a goal to be able to supply as, as a, as a, on, on, an, on an ongoing basis to point to the resources we're using. Um, so I think it's easier for us to tell you in general even um, which specific text, open textbooks and other OER we're using. Um, uh, more difficult would be updating that per semester. Um, but I would say if you're interested in specific areas, please shoot me an email but I'm hoping that in the coming months, we'll be able to post some of this information publicly. Great, thank you. Um, so another question, which disciplines are now fairly well covered in OER and which disciplines most lack OER? Um, so I, yeah, I mean, this is the kind of area where I, again, I encourage um, those of you who are supporting this work at different institutions to jump in. I can give you my opinions, but um, others will, will have better ideas, I'm sure. Um, I think one of the reasons why we have, for example, one of our, our first 
subject specific ZTC program with the Associate of Arts degree in sociology, because I think that's one example of a discipline that has quite a bit of OER, but also in ideologically, that's a department that aligns very closely with, with social justice um, in general. But I would say that there are many social sciences like this. Uh, you can cover most of the first two years of courses in sociology and psychology with, with uh, pretty good quality open textbooks. Um, there are STEM areas that are doing really well. But I'd say in general, uh, funding for open textbooks um, initially especially focused on high enrollment courses um, in the US, in Canada, and BC as well. And so uh, if you're looking for large survey courses, that's where you will find uh, the, the sort of biggest volume. Uh, and the niche areas is where you tend to see the universities publishing a lot more. But uh, math, uh, physics, biology, uh, certainly, if you're looking at English composition, uh, it, there's a wealth. It's harder when you get to, to literature, of course. Uh, but I would say it, these are the areas. Is, is social sciences, you have a fair bit. Uh, STEM areas, you have a fair bit. Um, and certainly, if people are motivated enough uh, to, to look at them, to adapt them, uh, you could certainly cover the first two years of much of these areas um, uh, with OER, I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. So that. Um... I think part of it is, is that, especially in the arts areas, the um, people are doing open education, but it's tied up in other things like um, uh, digital humanities or something like that. So it's not really kind of the same outputs, although technically it is open education resources. Uh, so there are a few more questions. Do your faculty openly share their syllabi? Um, no, not typically. I mean, I think this is an interesting question, though, in general, is the sharing is quite fascinating. And I think this is one of the reasons why if you have a conversation with faculty about OER, it very quickly becomes a conversation about teaching philosophy. Um, it, things like, you know, uh, do you use your textbook as, a, as the primary content delivery vehicle or is it a reference? And with sharing syllabi, I think there are these, there's the standardized course outline, which sort of curriculum committees have approved. Uh, but that uh, is the sort of generic template that is public. Uh, the individual variations for faculty are generally not publicly shared, even though there are individual faculty who, who will choose to make it available. Great. Thank you very much, Rajiv. Uh, we have to end on time because apparently this room is needed for another session. Um, oh, <laughs> so thank you very much for this session. I think this was uh, fantastic. And um, yes. Thank you very much and apologies for the technical difficulties everyone. Well, we apologize for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Everybody have a wonderful day.